This podcast recounts true crime events that contain adult themes. The content may be graphic or explicit, and as such, may not be everyone's cup of tea. Listener discretion is advised. Also, spoiler alert. White text on a black screen reads, The following is based on a true story, as archival footage of gentlemen with hunting dogs and horseback riders play in slow motion. We see a horse being led into a trailer wearing a navy blanket that reads, Foxcatcher Farms in yellow text. As the archival footage fades, we come across a young man practicing wrestling moves on a dummy. It then cuts to the same man sitting in his car placing a gold medal around his neck before exiting the vehicle and entering an elementary school. He speaks in front of a crowd of disinterested students, explaining that his name is Mark Schultz and that he won the gold medal around his neck in wrestling at the 23rd Olympic Games in Los Angeles, California. The scene then cuts to a woman writing a check for $20 for Mark in the school's front office, asking if his name is David or Dave. Mark explains that he is Dave's brother and that he filled in for him at the last second. Visibly uncomfortable, Mark affirms that both he and his brother won gold medals at the Olympics. Thus begins Bennett Miller's 2014 sports drama Foxcatcher and the true story of John DuPont and the murder of Dave Schultz. This is Crime Scene. John DuPont was born on November 22, 1938 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania as the youngest of four children to William DuPont Jr. and Jean Lister Austin. Both of his parents' families had immigrated from Europe to the United States at the beginning of the 19th century and became highly successful in the gunpowder and chemical businesses. In the 1920s and 30s, his parents acquired land as a wedding present from their maternal grandfather and developed Lister Hall Farm in Newtown Square, Pennsylvania, for thoroughbred horse breeding, showing, and racing. John himself grew up at Lister, being raised by his maternal grandmother. His mother retained the farm after the couple divorced in 1941 and added a dairy herd of Guernseys and bred Welsh ponies. John graduated from Haverford School in 1957 and went on to attend the University of Pennsylvania where he pledged Zeta Xi fraternity. Side note, famous brothers of Zeta Xi include Henry Ford II, Dean Cain, Dick Wolf, Brian Sullivan of CNBC's Worldwide Exchange, Dr. Spock, and William Shea of Shea Stadium. However, John withdrew from school before completing his freshman year, later attending college in Miami, Florida where he studied under famous scientist Oscar T. Orr. He graduated from the University of Miami in 1965 with a Bachelor's of Science in Zoology and later went on to complete a doctorate in Natural Science from Villanova in 1973. During his graduate work, John DuPont participated in several scientific expeditions to study and identify species of birds in the Philippines and the South Pacific. He is credited with the discovery of two dozen species of birds. He also founded the Delaware Museum of Natural History in 1957, where he served on the board and helped guide the institution towards opening in 1972. At the age of 45, John married 29-year-old occupational therapist Gail Wank on September 3, 1983, after meeting her while recovering from a hand injury he received in an auto accident. They lived together less than six months, and DuPont officially filed for divorce after 10. Wank sued DuPont for $5 million, claiming he had pointed a gun at her and attempted to push her into a fireplace. Their divorce was finalized in 1987, and Wank was excluded from inheriting his estate in his will, which at the time of their divorce was worth $200 million. That amount now equals $465,111,312.22. In 1985, John developed Lister Hall Farm into a sports facility for amateur wrestlers. He named the group Team Foxcatcher after his father's noted racing stable. It was around this time that John DuPont became acquainted with Olympic wrestling brothers Dave and Mark Schultz. Dave Schultz was born on June 6, 1959 to Dorothy Jean St. Germain and Philip Gary Schultz of Palo Alto, California. His younger brother Mark was born October 26, 1960. Dave began wrestling in junior high and rose to become a state champion by high school, also gaining national and international titles at this time. Mark, meanwhile, started in gymnastics, winning the Northern California All-Around Gymnastics Championships in his age group before switching to wrestling in his junior year of high school. By the time he was a senior, he was also a state champion. 
Dave was a three-time NCAA All-American, first at Oklahoma State University and twice at the University of Oklahoma. His career collegiate record was 91-8, 34 at Oklahoma State University, and 61-4 at the University of Oklahoma. Mark began his college career at UCLA going 18-8 in his freshman year. He then transferred to the University of Oklahoma, redshirted, and in the following three years from 1981 to 1983, won three NCAA championships. In his senior year, Mark went undefeated and set the University of Oklahoma record for most victories in a single season without a loss. Dave won 10 senior national titles, eight in freestyle and two in Greco-Roman wrestling over a 19-year span at three different weight divisions. In international competition, he won a 1983 World Championship and a 1984 Olympic gold medal. He won four World Cup and two Pan American Game titles and is the only American ever to twice win the prestigious tournament in Tbilisi, Georgia. In all, he was a seven-time World and Olympic medalist. In 1985, Mark won the World Championships and faced competitors from all of the Eastern Bloc countries who had boycotted the 1984 Olympics. Mark is the only 1984 Olympic champion to win the 1985 World Championships. His brother Dave was the only 1984 Olympic champion to have won the 1983 World Championships. When Mark won another World Championship in 1987, he became the first Olympic champion to add two additional world titles. He also tied Lee Kemp's U.S. record for world golds. In 1991, Mark Schultz, Lee Kemp, and John Smith were recorded in the Guinness Book of World Records as, quote, the most titles won by a U.S. wrestler. Together, Dave and his brother Mark, along with the Binock brothers, were the first American brothers to each win gold medals in the same Olympics, and likewise the only American brothers to win both World and Olympic championships. Mark was the first of the brothers to be recruited by John DuPont for Team Foxcatcher. Originally acting as a coach, Mark also prepared for World and Olympic trials with Foxcatcher teams. However, Mark quickly became annoyed with how John ran business at Foxcatcher, claiming that DuPont treated him like a trophy he could buy with a $70,000 salary. Eventually, Mark left and Dave joined the Foxcatcher coaching team and turned things around. The team became very successful, much of which was owed to Dave's positive personality and friendly coaching style. Quote, if it wasn't for Dave being at Foxcatcher, nobody else would have gone. He was a legend, just one of the best wrestlers in the world at the time, Olympic wrestler Kevin Jackson claims. Simultaneously, things did not seem to be going well for the figurehead of Foxcatcher Farms. In August of 1988, a wrestling program funded by John DuPont at Villanova was shut down after only two years of operation. The program had previously been flooded with controversy, and in December of that same year, a lawsuit claimed DuPont had made improper sexual advances towards the Villanova assistant wrestling coach, Andre Metzger. However, this issue was settled out of court. At the same time, John himself was training as a wrestler. In his 50s, he announced he would enter the competitive field with his only prior wrestling experience being during his freshman year of high school. He competed in the 1992 Veterans World Championships in Colombia, as well as following world championships in 93, 94, and 95. However, upon his mother's death in 1988, John's behavior began to become more and more erratic. It was well known to many of the trainers and wrestlers at Foxcatcher that John was often under the influence of cocaine and would lash out during these moments. Dave Schultz quickly became the only person who could handle John's antics. Though Dave could not stop or aid John in his struggle, he often claimed that he was being watched and the animals on the property were being controlled by dark magic. He hired a security task force to uproot the floorboards in an attempt to find secret tunnels and check the walls for spies that he claimed were watching his every move. Soon these antics affected the wrestlers' lives, with John kicking out Kevin Jackson and two other wrestlers, allegedly claiming that Foxcatcher was now a, quote, KKK organization and that no black wrestlers would be allowed there anymore. John even pulled a machine gun on wrestler David Shade, who says, quote, I was working out in the weight room. DuPont came in and pulled a gun on me and said, don't you fuck with me, I want you off the farm, in a very aggressive way. I couldn't tell he wasn't in the right state of mind. I cowered to him just enough to get him to back off. Then he left. I told local police. The next day I went to the local courthouse, put in a report there, then the county courthouse. He was definitely getting closer and closer to doing something where somebody was going to get hurt. Dave Schultz continued to be a guiding light for Foxcatcher, with Mike Gostigian saying, quote, Dave was the person closest to John. He was a calming influence, a confidant. But Dave wasn't a yes man. If John said he saw things coming out of the walls, Dave said nothing was coming out of the walls. I think John might have harbored some delusional fear of him. 
Indeed, John's animosity towards Dave grew as he could see that Dave was popular among the wrestlers at Foxcatcher and much preferred by them over himself. Many believed that John's delusions made him believe that Dave was also out to get him, and John grew increasingly unstable at the thought of that. On January 26, 1996, John DuPont ordered his head of security, Patrick Goodall, to drive him to Dave Schultz's home on the Foxcatcher property. When they arrived, they found Dave ready to greet them with a smile. John pointed a gun at Dave, asking him, You got a problem with me? before shooting him three times with a 44 Magnum. Goodall leaped out of the car, ready to defend Dave and himself with a small pistol he had hidden on his ankle, but John simply rolled up the window and drove back to the mansion, where he negotiated with police for two days before they disabled his power and captured him when he went outside to fix the heater. No motive for the killing was established or has ever been revealed. Friends of DuPont claimed the shooting was uncharacteristic and many were quick to come to his aid. Joy Hansen Lutner, a triathlete and former resident of the estate, claimed DuPont helped her through stressful moments in her life and quote, with my family and friends, John gave me a new lease on life. He gave me more than money. He gave himself emotionally. She continued stating, quote, there's no way John in his right mind would have killed Dave. Newtown Township Supervisor John S. Custer Jr. said, quote, At the time of the murder, John didn't know what he was doing. It was at this time that many others who knew or had worked with John revealed that he had showed signs of increasingly disruptive behavior in the months leading up to the murder. In September of 1996, John DuPont was ruled incompetent to stand trial as experts claimed he was psychotic and could not fully participate in his own defense. He was committed to a mental hospital and was to be reviewed by a court after three months there. During his trial, the defense expert psychiatric witnesses described DuPont as a paranoid schizophrenic who believed Schultz was part of an international conspiracy to kill him. They continued by claiming DuPont believed people would break into his house and kill him and he had installed a variety of security features in his house. He pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity, however the insanity defense was thrown out of court. On February 25, 1997, John DuPont was found guilty of third degree murder but mentally ill. Now a little law break for you guys, in Pennsylvania third degree murder is a lesser charge than that of first degree or second degree and indicates a lack of intent to kill. Additionally, the Pennsylvania Criminal Code designates that insanity applies to someone whose quote disease or defect leaves him unable to understand that his conduct is wrong or to conform it to law, which is also known as the monoton rule. This verdict meant that sentencing would be referred to the judge, the Honorable Patricia Jenkins, with a possibility of 5 to 40 years. She sentenced DuPont to 13 to 30 years incarceration and ordered he be housed at the State Correctional Institution in Mercer, a minimum security institution in Pennsylvania. Following the verdict, Dave Schultz's widow, Nancy, filed a wrongful death lawsuit against DuPont, with the amount of the settlement remaining undisclosed. Citing anonymous sources, the Philadelphia Inquirer reported that DuPont was to pay Schultz at least $35 million, which in 2020 would equal $56,709,268.60. DuPont's attorneys filed appeals, but in 2000, the verdict was upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court. John DuPont was first eligible for parole on January 29, 2009, but he was denied. In 2010, the Third Circuit U.S. Appeals Court in Philadelphia rejected all but one issue raised on an appeal, that involving his use of prescribed sopalamine before killing Schultz, and requested briefs. John DuPont was found unresponsive in his bed at the State Correctional Institution at Laurel Heights on December 9, 2010. He was pronounced dead at the age of 72, with an autopsy later finding the cause of death to be chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD. He was buried in his red Foxcatcher wrestling singlet in accordance with his will and buried at the DuPont de Nemours Cemetery in Wilmington, Delaware. His maximum sentence would have ended in January 2026, when he would have been 87. DuPont's will has been heavily disputed over the years. 80% of the estate was bequeathed to Bulgarian Olympic wrestler Valentin Yordanov, who had trained at Foxcatcher and his relatives. In June 2011, DuPont's niece Beverly A. DuPont Goggle and nephew William H. DuPont filed a petition to challenge the will in Media, Pennsylvania, asserting that DuPont was, quote, not of sound mind when writing it. The petition additionally claimed that during that period, DuPont asserted alternately that he was Jesus Christ, the Dalai Lama, and a Russian czar. The petition was dismissed, and while appealed, the Superior Court of Pennsylvania upheld the Delaware County Orphans Court order dismissing a challenge on the will on November 19, 2012. 
Lister Hall was demolished in January 2013, and the site of the home is now being developed into a, quote, master-planned community of 449 luxury homes called Lister Estate. Most of the outer buildings were also torn down, although the 7,000-square-foot historical barn will be used as a clubhouse for the new developments. Bennett Miller's Foxcatcher, depicting the events surrounding John DuPont and the murder of Dave Schultz, premiered at the 67th Annual Cannes Film Festival in May 2014, where it competed for the Palme d'Or, the festival's highest prize. While it lost that award to Nuri Bilgis Ceylon's Winter Sleep, Bennett Miller was awarded the festival's Best Director Award. It made its way through 2014's late film festival circuit and officially opened in U.S. theaters on November 14, 2014. The film received critical acclaim with the performances of Steve Carell, Mark Ruffalo, and Channing Tatum all receiving high praise. The film was nominated for several prestigious awards, including five Academy Awards, such as Best Director for Miller and Best Actor for Carell. Mark Schultz's response to the film has been complicated, with him praising Miller's work throughout conception and filming, even appearing in the film in a small cameo. However, after the film's release, Schultz voiced his irritation with Miller at implying that he and DuPont had engaged in a sexual relationship. While the Villanova incident was public knowledge, Schultz had never divulged that he had engaged in a romantic or sexual relationship with his brother's killer, saying of the film, quote, Foxcatcher scenes are mostly straight out of my book, except for a few, but the relationships and personalities are complete fiction. However, several weeks after these statements, Schultz recanted criticisms of the movie, saying, quote, Foxcatcher is a miracle. I'm sorry I said I hated it. I love it. And apologized to Miller. So now for the fun part, guys. I thoroughly enjoyed Foxcatcher so much more than I thought I would. I love the fact that it opened with actual footage of the family and their country follies. It was giving me very The Rules of the Game by Jean Renoir, which in turn is very reminiscent of rich people thinking they have everything they could want in life, but still making tragic decisions. I love the variation in training shots at the beginning of the film because you can't be stagnant when it comes to sports films. Like, you gotta move with these athletes. They're putting in the work, so you need to, too. I felt for Mark in the beginning, like, yes, baby, show off your medal. You earned it. Also, those kids were tripping. I would have been losing my shit to be in the same room as an Olympian. And him dealing with the constant comparisons between him and his brother, oh, baby, do I know the feeling. Because sometimes it is hard to be the younger sibling, even if you and your sibling are both highly successful because you always feel like you come up short because everyone insists on comparing the two of you. It is an unpleasant yet realistic mood. Also, can we take a moment to imagine winning a gold medal at the Olympics and going home to eat ramen by yourself every day? Because that's reality for a lot of Olympic athletes. Once your time passes, your fame is basically done aside from promotional appearances and sponsorships, which are not guaranteed. And it's not like just because you appeared at the Olympics once and or won a medal does not mean you get to come back every year with the same type of clout. You have to qualify for that shit. These are people we put on literal pedestals and then throw them back into obscurity because they no longer serve our needs. I would like to take a moment to recognize Channing Tatum's jaw because the tension he holds in his mouth throughout this film is unmatchable. Mark Ruffalo was looking like a straight up daddy with his full ass beard. And I love Mark Ruffalo, but I'm not normally attracted to him. But in this film, I was. I'm also mad that they showed me something I'd never seen before, aka a singlet with a shirt underneath it. I watched this film so I could see skin on skin contact. Fun fact, it takes 16 minutes for us to be introduced to Corel's DuPont. And honestly, it was worth it. I, of course, watched a lot of clips of the real John DuPont and documentaries aside from just this film. And the resemblance is uncanny. I think this was the first film to introduce Steve Carell as a dramatic actor to a lot of people, and I'm glad it did because he's honestly one of my favorite actors in recent memories. He commits so hard to his characters and manages to become so much larger than life, despite what I've read and seen about him maintaining a very low profile in real life. I also just love the magic of makeup and prosthetics because he truly transformed to look like this man. Once again, I'd like to give a shout out to Channing Tatum for showing off his wrestling moves in jeans because I can barely stand up in them, let alone duck and dive. DuPont's whole American spill was giving me too many Trump vibes and I shared Mark Ruffalo's wincing response. Also, like, the competition between Mark and Dave is ever present, yet Mark still wants Dave to join him at Foxcatcher because ugh, they love each other. It's so beautiful. Also, the architecture and housing in this movie, beautiful. I'm always on board for log cabin and hunting lodge aesthetics, but never on board for the killing of animals for sport aspect. 
Also, you know you're rich when you can just hand over a movie about your family to your new clients and be like, here, educate yourself. Channing Tatum sitting in front of that box TV in short shorts watching that documentary was a mood. I've also discovered from this film that I love wrestling ASMR, minus like the heavy breathing, just like the people hitting the mats with their bodies is soothing to me. Call me crazy. Vanessa Redgrave showed up in this Magenta number and came for my entire life. Also, on the subject of fashion, this movie is reawakening my love for 80s gym and athleisure wear. Plus, Mark Ruffalo's titties popping out of his singlet is everything I needed and more. Mark Schultz was barely associated with Foxcatcher, and John DuPont already had him acting like he was a cult member, talking about, like, How dare you not stand up to talk to John DuPont? Do you know who he is? Do you know who my father is? Like, that kind of vibe, like a Draco Malfoy kind of thing. It took us 47 minutes to get through this film before we got to see a smile from Channing Tatum. Kinda, it's like the smallest smile in the world, but it's something. And, like, Channing Tatum has a very warm smile to me. Like, I just, I don't know, he warms my heart. Also, I have to ask during the celebration scene, John, did you ask your mommy before you could take her trophies down? I don't think she'd be happy about it. I really want to enjoy the friendly male bonding during this scene, but knowing how this story ends, I just can't. I'm sorry if this is in poor taste too, but I loved John's sideways shooting stance while practicing shooting with the police officers. Just the way his legs were like glued together, yet his feet were in this first position hoo-ha, it got to me. Also like the symbolism of the team running past him during the practice and cheering him on, knowing that later on he thinks everyone's secretly out to get him. Also him coming into the training room with a gun in his hand, good lord. Not gonna lie, I clutched my pearls a little bit when he shot at the ceiling. I forget what this is in reference to, but I did write down all means necessary. His ass is not an accessory. I, I don't know, guys. There John go again, alienating Mark's family. Also, I really thought this man was about to be like, oh, Mark, you don't have to call me sir every time. You can just call me John. But he came out of nowhere with that. My friends call me Eagle or Golden Eagle. Either one of those work. Like, bitch, first of all, what friends? <laughs> and second off, what makes you think you deserve that title? Also really didn't understand the whole tank buying scene and don't understand why it was included. Uh, the cocaine in the helicopter, however, was peak 80s wealth and the conversation of them discussing which words come first is definitely a reflection of me talking to myself after drinking alone on a Saturday night. And out of nowhere, Channing Tatum starts sporting this 90s Brad Pitt frosted tips vibe and it hurt me inside. Then Dave comes back in this suit and the thick framed glasses and was giving me major David Cross vibes. Also side note, even when you type David Cross into Google Images, Mark Ruffalo pops up as a suggested search. Wild. Throughout the film, I was thoroughly confused as to why the Foxcatcher singlets are red and gold, yet the training gear is navy and gold, and I never got an explanation for this. Does anyone have the answer? Please? Mark's breakdown scene after his first round loss was upsetting, the mirror breaking was not expected, yet I cheered along with him while he ate his feelings. I also loved how Mark Ruffalo casually broke into his brother's hotel room and then walked over and slapped him multiple times. Also, side note, according to Channing Tatum, he and Mark Ruffalo spent an intensive five to six months training for wrestling, which took a lot of toll on them, obviously. And during this particular take, Channing insisted that Mark just slap the shit out of him to get it over with, his words, not mine. And it resulted in Channing's eardrum accidentally getting popped. That's the take they used in the film, guys. And I'm just, I can't handle it. I just can't. Like, oh. The tenderness of that scene post all the violence made me light, but, and trigger warning for those that are very uncomfortable with eating disorder stories, they ruined it with the food purging, which I understand was included to emphasize the importance put on weight classes in wrestling, but overall it just did not feel like the move. Also, the most important question I had walking away from this film. How did he gain 12 pounds in a matter of hours? Then they show him burning it all off again in the hour he has before his next match. That is so terrible for that man's body. And obviously this commentary is coming from someone who has no prior knowledge of wrestling or nutritional sciences for that matter. But I'm still like very unnerved because it just seems highly highly problematic and unhealthy and I worry if this is actually something that wrestlers have to deal with in real life. 
I loved the use of inaudible scenes with Nat sound in the background to really give off the feel of the sports world because we can never really hear or know what athletes are thinking during their matches or games. And it's always been a pet peeve of mine when films choose to include narration of these moments just because it's more thrilling to hear about it after the fact. That's my personal opinion. You can choose to disagree. I'm not going to be mad about it. John letting all the horses go after his mother's death was like big symbolism for not being under her control anymore. Yet he remained on his family's land because if you think about it, that's all he's ever known. But that means that he'll have to live with the fact that he'll never truly be rid of her. Hashtag cinema. I'm honestly really upset the film didn't get nominated for best score at the Academy Awards either because it was one of my favorite aspects of the film. And finally, the death scene just felt like it came out of nowhere in my opinion, and it was very quick, which I guess you could attribute to the real life crime, but I did not hate the way it was enforced. I just kind of felt, you know, like, oh wow, which obviously was the point, I guess. Um, while Rotten Tomatoes has it at an 87% fresh and Metacritic rates it at a 7.89 out of 10, I give Foxcatcher an 8 out of 10 spooks. I give Foxcatcher an 8 out of 10 spooks for the fantastic performances and the jaw-dropping audacity of most of these characters. Since Schultz's death, U.S. Wrestling has hosted an annual Dave Schultz Memorial International Wrestling Meet at the United States Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs, Colorado. In June 1997, Dave Schultz was posthumously inducted into the U.S. National Wrestling Hall of Fame. Nancy Schultz remarried in 2015 and has remained active in the wrestling world, having received the Order of Merit from the National Wrestling Hall of Fame in 2018. Mark Schultz stopped wrestling competitively after the 1988 Summer Olympic Games and dabbled in wrestling-related activities throughout the 90s, such as UFC fighting, but now lives in Oregon where he offers wrestling clinics. Thank you so much for listening to Crime Scene A. All of the information you heard in this episode can be traced back to Bennett Miller's Foxcatcher, Wikipedia, allthatsinteresting.com, Barry Trammell's 2018 article about Nancy Schultz for The Oklahoman, and of course, IMDb. The music you've heard throughout the episode is by my friend Colby. I'll include his SoundCloud in the description. And I'd like to dedicate this episode to the family of Dave Schultz and any former wrestlers of Team Foxcatcher. I'd also like to take a moment to extend my well wishes to the DuPont family, as just because there is one bad apple in a bunch does not mean the whole thing is rotten. We can't change history, but we can educate for the future. I'm Alyssa Chester, and please be kind and stay enlightened. Mm -hmm.